The invasion of Japan was a nightmare scenario for most US military personnel, regardless of rank or branch. Especially after the high losses on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, the US leadership wanted to reduce its casualties as much as possible. Hence the use of atomic and chemical weapons to support landings was given serious consideration. Now let's look at the situation the US commanders were confronted with. Due to the Allied intelligence programs and the capture of Japanese codebooks, the US military intelligence was informed rather well on the Japanese preparations. It gave the US, as the military historian Edward Drea put it, previews of hell. Now there were three major points that became evident over the months of planning. First, the number of Japanese troops was increasing considerably over the months on the island of Kyushu. The initial numbers were around 230,000 troops, yet it rose consistently over the months to 600,000 or more in August 1945. Additionally, the Japanese correctly assumed that the invasion would take place in the southern part of Kyushu. The US deception measures that worked well on D-Day didn't foil the Japanese. Thus it became quite clear that the number of defenders would probably match those of the attackers. This is even problematic for a regular attack, let alone for an amphibious assault. Second, the willingness of the Japanese to fight until death was still there. No signs of defeatism nor pessimism in the radio transmission. Considering that the Japanese fought this way for years already, it was unlikely that it would decrease once they were defending their home islands, quite on the contrary. Third, descriptions of Japanese naval and air force messages conjured up still fresh and painful memories of mass suicide attacks of the Philippines and Okinawa. The Japanese were converting all kinds of planes for kamikaze attacks. Additionally, workers were building suicide boats and manned torpedoes, the so-called kaiten. Yet this time the Japanese would be able to bring more vehicles into the fight and from far closer bases than they could at Okinawa or Iwo Jima. This all meant that the US and Allied forces had to consider very high losses. Note that Okinawa was the bloodiest battle in the Pacific and that the garrison at Kyushu was six times the size of Okinawa's. Not to mention the large amount of dedicated suicide forces. Additionally, the terrain was similar on both islands. Hence the US leadership and planners considered various options in order to reduce the losses. Some included the use of reversed engineers V2s or B-17s filled with napalm. Others were the use of chemical, nuclear and even biological weapons. But let's look at the chemical and nuclear considerations. Already for the invasion of Iwo Jima, the US considered the use of chemical weapons. Since neither Japan nor US signed treaties on the ban of poison gas, but Franklin Roosevelt completely opposed the use of gas. Yet since Roosevelt died in April 1945, the situation changed in that regard. Additionally, Truman succeeded at a time when the casualties per day in the Pacific reached an all-time high. For the invasion of Japan, the use of poison gas was clearly considered. At least one author states that tests were conducted on how effective poison gas could be against terrain with caves and underground fortifications and that the plan for the invasion included the use of poison gas with troops landing with gas masks and full protective gear. Additionally, the military historian Gian Greco, who wrote a highly respected book on Operation Downfall, notes that the plans one day prior to the Japanese surrender were changed, to use nuclear weapons in combination with chemical weapons. Which brings us to the next point, namely the use of atomic bombs to support the landing. The case is quite interesting due to the reactions of the Japanese and US leaderships on the bombing of Hiroshima. Already before the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, George Marshall, asked the director of America's atomic bomb program if it could be used as a tactical weapon. The director reported that the blast could wipe enemy resistance in an area of 600 meters in diameter and that slit trenches would not protect sufficiently against the blast but the troops in caves a mile away from the blast would be able to continue to fight. Yet after the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, the chances for an invasion didn't decrease to the initial Japanese reactions. Codebreakers with dispassionate eyewitness Japanese military assessments of Hiroshima downplaying the enormous destruction. One vivid ultra description of 100,000 casualties actually seems to have affected Truman more than Japan's warlords. Furthermore, after Hiroshima, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Then Nagasaki was also hit by an atomic bomb. Still, the Japanese just offered a conditional surrender. The US Army intelligence assumed that there would be no decisive effect from atomic bomb attacks in the next 30 days. And that further attacks on cities would not change the situation. 
Marshall's plans call for most and if he could convince Stimson and Truman all of the current and future atom bombs to be dropped on Japanese defense concentrations along or near the beaches. Now this would amount to about 7 to 9 nukes that would have been ready to support Operation Olympic. The bombs would be dropped in Japanese positions while the US soldiers and marines would wait embarked a few miles offshore and then attack two days later. Although I'm not sure how valid this is, because the Japanese kamikaze attacks would be conducted once ship entered a certain range of the islands, which was far greater than a few miles. It is important to note, although the unwillingness of the Japanese to surrender was an issue, the determining factor was the envisioned heavy casualties on US landing forces. Of course, we don't know what would have happened, yet the tactical use of atomic bombs to support the landings was a clear option for the US military. Luckily, the Japanese surrendered. Considering what would have happened if the US had bombed the southern part of Kyushu with several atomic bombs and then conduct an amphibious landing on the reactive beaches is hard to imagine. Back then the full implications of radioactivity weren't completely known. The losses of both sides would have been tremendous, if not on the battlefield then later on. Or as the military historian Edward Dreher put it, Olympic would not have invaded the land of the gods but the world of the dead.